As we explore new approaches to concurrent instruction, we will see how a fourth grade teacher uses project-based learning to increase engagement, foster collaboration, and meet the needs of students, both in the classroom and at home. I'm using this DBQ as a PBL because I think it really increases student engagement. I feel like when we do PBLs, the students are more invested in what we're learning about, they're excited about it, and they want to get the information because creating that end product is so exciting for them to do. All right, friends, we are back here. And today in Social Studies, we are going to continue with our PBL, okay? Our driving question that we started yesterday, can I have a volunteer who would love to read it? Oh, Sunny online. Perfect. Sunny, can you read this nice and loud for us? How can you, as a historian, create an infographic? The teacher starts the unit with an open-ended driving question that connects course content to real-world application. Students think about and share what they need to know in order to successfully respond to the driving question. This need-to-know list, generated by students, helps to guide the learning for the next several days. This leads to higher engagement and deeper, more authentic purpose for learning the content. But how can we do this successfully in concurrent instruction? Let's take a look and read our need to knows that we started yesterday. Can I have someone volunteer and start to read? Elliot, can you start from the top? How many colonists? Perfect. So to answer this question, we want to know how many colonists is OK. <laughs> that will be important thinking about how they died. Sunny, did you have another one for our need to knows? Who are they? Who are they? You probably noticed the students were making the list through asking questions while the teacher records and organizes their thinking on chart paper. She sets up the facilitation space so she can interact with the students in school and at home and can easily write on the paper behind her. The camera is positioned so students at home can easily see what she is writing and she projects this view so in-class students can see the list on the screen. When we create our need to know list or um, we're brainstorming ideas, I like to make sure that I'm alternating and taking turns calling on students both virtually and in person. Um, I also met, like to make sure that you know the volume is quite high so that they feel like part of that classroom atmosphere as well and everyone can hear their ideas. After students generate the need to know list, it's up to the teacher to create manageable options for them to inquire and learn. In this case, the teacher has structured an opportunity for students to read and interact with a primary source that will help them answer a few of their questions. But I also broke it up into slides here because we're gonna be thinking about this reading and we're gonna have a discussion with a partner, okay? You're gonna get your computers out and you're gonna to talk to an online partner or another online partner about this background essay. So your job is going to be to read this essay and to think about important details that you notice, questions that you have, okay, and anything that pertains to this driving question right here. Okay, so my friends online, you have some tools that you can use. You have a little box with a question mark saying, huh, this confuses me. You have an exclamation point saying, ooh, this is surprising. Or you have this circle that you can drag for important things and make bigger. Now, if you're in person, you're going to be using your pencil. The teacher offers clear directions, differentiated resources, including slides, printed text, and graphic organizers, and used a thinking strategy to deeply explore the document. Using thinking strategies in the classroom is so important for them because students are able to think deeper about what we're learning about. They're able to put things into perspectives, think critically, and analyze primary, secondary sources, other documents, and then see one another's point of view as well. And it just takes that surface level understanding to a much deeper level. And now that students have had a chance to explore individually, they'll go deeper by sharing their thinking with classmates. This conversation will extend learning and support relationship building. Using Google Slides allows multiple students to be in the same um, document together, so they're able to add their own ideas but see one another's ideas as well. They're able to collaborate with one another, but you can also assign individual slides as well. So if you wanted to differentiate or make it you know, more guided or more open-ended, the students are able to access that 
and really take it from there in whatever way they want to. Okay, so I'm going to share this with you in the chat. If you are at school, I'm going to put it in our regular Google Classroom. It'll be on the stream as a link since we are not in BBCU. And if you have anything you want to talk to them about, does everyone know where this is at the bottom? Sometimes it's like the presenter notes. There you can talk back and forth. This morning I saw that Navia and Mia were chatting in their boxes together with each other. It's just like that. Or you can use the comments, good Sophia, that's also an excellent place to put it. While we are seeing students explore a document then share with peers, students could have inquired in a variety of ways, like a short lecture, watching a related teacher-selected video, independently reading a book, or researching on their own. Each of these options for learning can work in concurrent instruction. There's no right way. The key is for students to learn in a way that is challenging, supported, and reinforces important skills. No matter how students learn, it's important for the teacher to regularly check on their understanding and progress. Traditional formative assessments, like short quizzes, can be incorporated, but seen artifacts of students' learning, like graphic organizers, brainstorming and research documents, and visible thinking routines can reveal even more. Using Google Slides also allows me to pop into each of their slides, or if we're doing a whole class lesson, see where each one of them are. That way I can provide extra support if they need it, or point out some really great things and have them share with the class their thoughts and their ideas as well. No matter what, I'm able to have that one-on-one -on -one connection with students, regardless if they're at home or in person. Ms. Reed has taken engaging practices and transitioned them to work during concurrent instruction. She's taken risks, found some things that don't work, and figured out what does make sense for her and her students. Here are some tips she's experienced for helping the transition to go more smoothly. I would say the biggest challenge for a teacher using concurrent instruction is to not overcomplicate things. Simplify. I would say flexibility is probably the most important word for concurrent instruction. Sometimes you try things and it falls flat on its face and you're having to, okay, let's try something new. And so flexibility for us in our instruction and trying new things, but also flexibility for students, allowing them to show what they know in a different way. It might not be how you normally do it in the classroom, but we can show that in different ways and giving them the chance to do that as well. Using PBL and concurrent instruction is just a perfect fit because the students at home have access to the same materials as the students in person. They're able to access the information, they're able to try new things, get creative. As you begin concurrent instruction, think about how you can increase engagement. Provide social interaction and collaboration that will bridge the gap between students at home and in the classroom, and how you can check student progress so that we can best ensure that all students' needs are met to the best of our ability.